All right. Um, man, Mosaic Online, uh, good to see you. I'm Chuck Eastman. I think you know that already. Uh, if you don't go to Mosaic, um, I'm so glad to meet you. And uh, as you know, it is a crazy time. Uh, Mosaic Conway has actually never done anything quite like this uh, before. And it's just a really interesting uh, time for the life of the universal church. I can think of no time in all of my studies of church history where the church couldn't gather uh, because of a health reason. Maybe there are times I don't know about, uh, but for as far as I can remember, uh, we've never had a time quite like this. And it's crazy. It's wild uh, by any definition. This is a wild time uh, to be alive. And so I just want to tell you just on the front end of what we're doing. Um, what we're going to be doing as you're watching this is we're hoping to gather you around Jesus and, uh, and then hopefully to empower you to live in a way that would love your neighbors. And so uh, just a couple things as we've been going on, just kind of processing through how we're going to do church in these next few seasons. Um, I just want to just show you some of the things that we're going to be doing so that you would know. And then we're going to get into a time of worship uh, and teaching. So just a couple things I want to show you real quick. Just a basic game plan for us here uh, at Mosaic. Um, our Sunday services now are going to be completely online. What you're watching right now, this is going to be our Sunday services. But we're actually not just posting a video online. Uh, what you're actually going to see is through our Facebook, we want to generate a conversation about church, just as if you were going to come into the building and you were going to talk with your friends and you were going to sit in a chair and begin to have talking uh, points with the people sitting around you. We want to develop that um, before we watch the video at 1030. So right now we're watching the video and hopefully we've generated enough conversation among people in the church that you know about this and that you've been having an online conversation with someone before church starts. And then what's going to happen is, is after church is over, after the video is over, um, our small groups are going to spearhead a conversation. There's going to be links on this Facebook page and there'll be a variety of links where you can come in either through Zoom or Facebook video messenger or maybe through Skype and those av available opportunities for you to come in and be a part of a conversation as soon as the service is over. So normally our church service ends at 12 o'clock and our goal is to have this video done by 1130 and then when we get done you would go down to one of those links and you would either Zoom or Skype or Facebook Live Messenger in to one of our smaller conversations. And what we're going to do in that moment is we're going to pray together. Maybe you've got a bunch of stuff on your mind and on your heart right now. And what we want you to do is we want you to be able to pray together. We want you to be able to share your concerns and maybe even reflect about what God is doing in your life in this season. So what we don't want to do, and this is the absolute last thing we want, is we don't want you to watch the video, turn off your computer, and then go about your day. We want you to connect with the church. We want you to connect with the people of God. Just because we can't gather in person doesn't mean we shouldn't gather and we need to gather. We need to be a family around Jesus. And so when the service is over, when the video is over, go down to one of those links and video in with one of our small groups, share your heart, ask for prayer, and then pray together before we're done with our Sunday services. So that's what we're gonna be doing um, today as we worship. Uh, that also addresses what we're doing with our community groups. So that's our community groups will spearhead that. Now, listen, if you're not in one of our community groups, that's okay. You just choose one of those links and become one of those parts of the conversation, right? So every Sunday when we get done, our community groups will spearhead these conversations. And if you're not in a group, this is a great opportunity for you to jump in, be in that conversation, ask for prayer, and to be a part of a family. So that's what we're doing with our community groups. The kids and the youth ministry. Uh, Miss Karen, um, who is our uh, kids director, is going to be putting together packets. And in the next few weeks, as we continue to do online services, um, the curriculum that we use to disciple your kids will either be delivered to your house, if we have your address. Now, if you're in our system, you've been plugged into our planning center system, we have your address. We'll deliver the packet to your house or we'll email it to you directly. If we don't have your address, if you've never even been in the building at Mosaic, you can give us your address and we would love to deliver the curriculum to you. Now, here's what's awesome about that. You have your kids at home and I'm sure you're going crazy, but this is an opportunity to disciple your kids. This is an opportunity for you to do devotions with your kids, right? You are the shepherds and the pastors of your own home. 
and you need to take responsibility to disciple your kids in the way of the Lord. And we wanna put tools in your hands. So every single week, either we will deliver it to your house or we will email it to you directly. Now, if we don't have your address, you can Facebook message us, give us your address, we'll deliver it. If we don't have your email address, give us your email address through Facebook Messenger, direct message us on our Facebook page, and we will email it to you. But we want you to disciple your kids. We are not stopping the mission of the church just because we can't gather together corporately. So that's what we're doing with our kids ministry. Wednesday night, on Wednesday night, we have prayer at 630. If you would like to be a part of that, we're gonna provide opportunities through online, either through Zoom or through Skype. And we'll provide a link on Wednesday night. If you want prayer, if you wanna be a part of that, we'll give you a link, watch our Facebook page. You'll come in and we'll pray together as a church. Pastoral care. We're, we're going to increase our office hours. So what's going to happen is from starting on Monday of this next week, um, Monday through Friday, we will cover the office from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. Now, we'll have an hour break there for lunch in the middle, but from 9 in the morning till 5 p.m., we will cover the office here at 2125 Hark Rider. That means that if you want to come and have a pastor pray with you, you can come to the building and we will be here 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., Monday through Friday for the near future. So if you need to talk to a pastor, if you need to call a pastor, um, that's your opportunity uh, to communicate uh, with us. Now we're gonna have plenty of service opportunities. We'll let you know that through our Facebook page and we have ways for you to continue to give faithfully online. I want to show you a couple of those quickly. You can give through our mosaicconway.net uh, website. It's very easy. You can give online through that. Um, it's, it's painless, it's quick, and it's easy. We would encourage you uh, to do that. You can also text to give at 84321. It's an awesome opportunity. It's very quick. I've done it on my own phone. You can quickly text to give uh, through that, or you can mail in your check at 2125 Hark Rider Street, Suite 39, Conway, Arkansas. All right. Now, these are three easy, painless ways. In fact, if you just want to come to the church and you want to drop off your tithes and offerings, you can do that, right? But here's what we would encourage you to do. We would encourage you to continue to be faithful, continue to chase Jesus, and continue to trust him with everything that you have. All right, those are my announcements. What I would like to do is I want to introduce to you who's here. So uh, in this circle, I have uh, Dr. Lewis Young. Uh, Lewis is our pastor of Celebrate Recovery. About 50 to 60 people meet every Monday night. And uh, Lewis has been leading that for quite some time. It meets here at Mosaic on Monday nights. They also will not be meeting in person, but I wanted Lewis here tonight and he's gonna be a part of what we're talking about uh, this evening. Um, Andrew is here. Andrew's gonna be doing some worship for us. We're pumped about Andrew and he's my favorite redhead. Just want everybody in the world to know that. Even Patrick, Patrick, if you're watching this, Andrew is now my favorite redhead, okay? Just wanted you, Patrick, if you're out there in the internet, I know it's very tough, but I just, you've now graduated to being my favorite redhead. Um, Anna uh, is here. Anna is married to uh, Randall Woods, who's in the background. You can't see him, but he's out there in the background making sure that we're doing this. Um, and Anna's here, and uh, you know her, helping with the young adults group, working in the kids uh, ministry. She's also got a baby on the way. And uh, we're excited that she would uh, be here with us. And LaShawn, who also serves in our kids' ministry, uh, is here. We're pumped about her being here uh, tonight. And then, of course, my co-elder, uh, Lloyd Hodges, is here. And so here's what we're doing. Uh, Dr. President Trump said less than 10. So we've got less than 10. We did that on purpose. Um, and our goal is, uh, during these next few weeks, is for a small group of us to come together and to process God's word together and to worship together. And part of the reason for that is we want to encourage you to stay connected to us as a family. So each week you're going to see different people, different people in the Mosaic Conway family. And we're going to worship. You're going to watch us worship. But here's what we're trying to do. As we worship, we're trying to look over our shoulder and say, come with us. Worship with us. As we look at God's word together, we want to say to you, look at God's word with us. Right? That's what we want to do together as a family. So with that said, uh, Lloyd, uh, could you greet us and then pray to get us started? Hello, Mosaic. Um, this is a unique opportunity for us here. Um, you know, in that we can't gather, it's really not healthy. Uh, we want to be obedient uh, to the law of the land. 
but that should not prevent us from being able to worship our Lord and our Savior. Um, I thank God for technology, and I thank God for people who love technology, mm. because technology is going to enable us to weather this storm. And it is a storm. <clears throat> we are topsy-turvy right now, and I think we're all beginning to sort of feel the pinch of that. But we're here to encourage you. Do not be afraid. Because we have a God who cares so deeply for Ooh. us. And in his word, he has expressed time and time again his power, his might, his sovereignty. And he is going to use this time to reveal who he is to us. Mm. And I believe that we are going to see his glory. Mm. So for this time, if we could encourage each of you to walk with us, I think we're all going to get through this together. But like uh, if we're starting out on a journey, the first thing that we need to do is to pray before we get on task. And so if you would, take a moment and pray with us, please. Uh, Lord God, uh, we come to you right now seeking encouragement. We ask that you would remove the spirit of doubt and mm. fear negativity and confusion from our minds. Lord, please continue to show us who we are and how great you've created us to be. Mm. So lift us up, Father God, out of the mire of confusion and the mire of chaos. Lift us up so that we can see you, so that we can see heaven so that we can be all that you have called for us to be. And Lord, uh, for these days to come, we pray that each one of us would allow you to be our vanguard and go before us, Father God, because we know not where we go. We don't have any ideas about what we might encounter And I'm not putting off our humanness, Father. These are scary times. But you are greater than all that is going on on the face of this earth, Lord. You have created all of this, Father God, this earth. And you have placed us in it. And you have made the promise, Lord, that you would never abandon us. You would never leave us alone. You would never leave us on our own. And so right now, Father, uh, we come to you to let you know that we're taking stock in that. And if we haven't been, Father God, I think we will fast do so. We're just seeking your mercy. We're seeking your grace and we're seeking your love. And we just ask, Lord, that you would be kind towards us. And Lord, compel us to be kind toward our fellow man. And we come now, Father God, to worship you, to lift you up, and to praise your holy name. So add your blessing to our effort. And we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. To my heart 
God, we, uh, we're leaning toward you right now. Uh, we've often leaned on our own understanding. And you have a way, God, of getting things we couldn't lean on out of the way. And we are in a time right now where there are few things to lean on that we can lean on with any confidence. Uh, we, we can't really lean on our job. Oh, how frail that is in a moment. 
And yet we, we can't seem to lean on it. We can't seem to lean on our health with any confidence, knowing that we're going to be fine. And everything's going to be fine and we're not going to get sick. We, we don't really have a lot of confidence in that. We live in the modern world and we can often lean on the healthcare system. And yet we, we don't know if we can lean on that. We're in a place right now, God, where you're all we really have to lean on. You're it. And uh, so we, in this moment, we confess with our mouth that we are leaning towards you. Our hearts are towards you. Our minds are towards you. We're leaning toward you, and we need you. Oh, we, we've always needed you, but we never really were quite sure about it. It was easy to think that we were all right without you, or we had it on our own pretty well, but, but we have a lot of confidence right now that you're all we got. And God, we pray that you would help us understand you're all we really need. God, would you do that through your word? God, help us to look at it. Would your spirit allow our hearts to believe what your word says? And God, would you show yourself? God, we don't need anything more than to see you for who you really are. And we need nothing as much as for you to speak to us. That's what we need. So would you do that in these moments? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Andrew, for playing some songs for us. Um, so what we're going to do uh, is we're going to spend some time looking at God's Word, and, and we've got a group here. And so I'm going to do uh, some teaching, but really more of an interactive teaching um, with the group. And I've got some questions and at different times, people in the group will be encouraged to uh, jump in and to kind of share uh, their thoughts and their minds on it. And, uh, I, you know, I just want to front this by saying uh, we just live in this crazy uh, time of uncertainty. I mean, it's just a wild uh, time of uncertainty. And, um, and with that uncertainty is, is fear. Like, I, don't, I think we'd all be liars to say that we don't have some underlying fear. Um, I like to... I want to project that I'm not afraid. I want to project that I've got all the confidence in the world. Uh, I would like to project that I don't have any fear of what's going to happen in our city and in our church. And um, But if I were honest, if I were to drill down below, there'd be a really healthy amount of, or unhealthy amount of fear. Um, and it wouldn't, wouldn't be far away from bubbling into hysteria if I could talk about it long enough. If we sat one-on-one -on -one and I got to talking, I could dig myself into a, a tunnel pretty quickly of just the things that could happen, the things that we might be seeing happen right before our eyes. And so uncertainty attached to fear. Um, and then there's, there's real suffering. Um, we don't have to wait to know that there are already people that are really suffering. And of course, part of our fear is that real suffering is on its way to us. Or if it's not, it's on its way to us, it's on its way to people we really love. Um, we already have people in our body that are struggling with their health, um, with no, no virus um, that we know of. No one's positive in our body that we know of uh, to the coronavirus. Um, but there are people already struggling with their health. There are people already struggling uh, with cancer. Um, there are people already struggling financially. They don't need any virus uh, to suffer anymore. They're already uh, suffering. Uh, and yet there's a fear that suffering would be uh, increased, uh, both in our, our lives um, and in the lives of the people that we love. And so those things are always kind of coming together pretty consistently in our hearts and in our minds. And uh, we just want to ask ourselves the question, does God have anything to say? Or is he silent? I mean, does he, does he actually have something to say to us um, in these moments? Or are we on our own? Are we, have we been set out? Has God opened the sky, put the wheels in motion, and he's watching us down here, um, you know, seeing how it all plays out? Uh, or does he actually have something to say? Is he close? Is he at hand? Is he in our midst? And if he does have something to say, then what does he have to say? And what I want to do is I want to look, I want to take a few moments to look at Romans 8, because Romans 8 is like a right hook to uncertainty. 
Like if the Bible had anything to say about uncertainty, if it was a boxing match and uncertainty was coming at us like crazy, Romans 8 would be God's word and God's voice to throw a right hook at uncertainty. Just to smash it in the mouth and knock it out. It would be a right hook to fear. It would be God's word as clear as we could ever get it about fear. And it would be the right hook of God's word towards suffering. That it would directly address what God says about suffering. So we're going to look at it. Um, we're going to actually discuss it a little bit. There's some, there's, some, there's some phrases in here that, man, if we get our minds around them, uh, it's going to be wild. Like, that's in God's word. We're going to go back and we're going to go, can that even be true for me? Can that be true for us? And, uh, and it's, I think it can be. And what we're going to pray is that we're going to pray that God would help us believe the truth of them. Uh, because that's what's going to happen. We can read them all day long. They can be on coffee cups. We can even put them on a t-shirt. And if the Holy Spirit doesn't make them true to us, uh, then it just really doesn't matter, right? So we're going to look at God's word. I want to show you that. Um, Romans 8, we're going to start in chapter and verse uh, 18. And uh, we're going to put that up here on the screen for you at home. Uh, we've also got our Bibles here. But I'm going to look at the screen here. And I want to show you this. Verse 18, I'm just going to read it. Paul says this, for I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. That's the Bible's way of saying that all of creation is, is waiting for the family of God to emerge. Sons and daughters to come forth to be seen by everyone. It's waiting for the family of God. For all of creation was subject to you fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, verse 21, that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. That's the family of God. So there's this creation that's groaning, and a family that's wanting to come out. A creation that's groaning and a family that wants to be unleashed, that wants to be seen by the world. And here's what it says. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Not only the creation, but we ourselves who are the first fruits of the Spirit. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of of our bodies. What that means is that the world is under it. Our bodies are under it, and the world is under it. And the world, the world system is groaning. Ah, oh, man, we can see that everywhere. Maybe more clearly than we've ever seen it any time in our lives, we can look around the world and we can see the groaning of the world system. We can see the suffering of the world system. Sometimes we can hide from it. Sometimes we watch enough TV, we listen to enough good music, um, we entertain ourselves enough, our jobs are coming through consistently, our bank account's doing great. We can sometimes forget that the world is groaning. But in moments like this, man, we can see it. It's groaning. And not only is the world groaning, but we're groaning. We're groaning under the curse of sin and brokenness. And so the question is, what does God have to say about that? If the, word is, the world is groaning, if we're groaning in our physical bodies, then what does Jesus, what does God have to say about that? And I want to show you this. Look at verse 24. For in this hope we're saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. In other words, what we're about to talk about takes faith. It means I can't necessarily see what's about to happen. I can't see if we're going to have enough hospital beds. I can't see if I'm, my grandma's not going to get sick. I can't see what's going to happen 20 minutes from now. I can't see it, so I have to hope. And he says here, this is it. We have a hope, but hope we can't be seen. For who hopes from what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. In other words, in my weakness, I'm afraid. In my weakness, I'm suffering. In my weakness, I do not know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know. But the Spirit helps us in our weakness. So I want you to go to the first question. Um, 
Can you think of a moment where you felt powerless? Because that's exactly what Paul's talking about. Can you imagine being more powerless than to realize that the whole world is under the curse of sin and that every one of us is groaning in our bodies from the suffering of the world system? The suffering of sin in our bodies, the suffering of brokenness in the world, that idea makes us powerless. And then God comes through and he says something to that and he says, I help you in your weakness. So my, my question is, is uh, can you think of a moment when you've ever felt so powerless? Anybody want to jump in on that? Just a moment where you just felt powerless. And Lloyd has the mic so he can uh, hold up the mic if you've got it or, if, yeah. Go ahead, LaShawn. Well, I mean, I think we're there right now. Okay. You know? I know there are other situations. Hold it up for your team out there, Mr. Um, Shine. I know there are other situations, but if we think now, you know, where we are, we're, we're powerless. Um, things yeah. are changing by the day. Yeah. Um, there's not much that we can do. And so I, I think that moment of weak or powerlessness or that feeling yeah. of powerlessness is not true. Um, right. Because we can do something in that moment. Yeah. But I'd say that this would be one of those times. Yeah. It just it's hard to imagine a time where you could you just had so few things you could grab onto for comfort. Right? It's all kind of unsteady, you know? Are we going to get to be able to go to the grocery store? Right? Next week is it all going to be closed down and we can't leave our homes at all? You know, it just seems so unsteady and it does it's a sense of powerlessness. Is anybody else just a sense of feeling powerless? Well, I guess kind of along with that, it's not just that we realize right now that we're powerless, yeah. but we're realizing how powerless we really are. Right. Like this is showing just in general. This yeah. is just like a moment, but like we just can't control what we think we can yeah. control. I think that's probably just as unsettling as everything else that's unsettling. It's almost like a wake-up call, right? Yeah. Like we're this vulnerable, right? We're this small in the world, Right. Um, that something like this could just all of a sudden take off and we'd be in this moment of, of weakness. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that what's so awesome is that this, you have this real clear, go back up to the verse, the verse before that, Randall. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. So here's what it says. We wait for the hope, right? The rescue, right? That's coming. The rescue for creation and the rescue for our broken bodies. We wait for it with hope with patience. How do you do that? Like, how do you do that? How do you wait when you don't see it coming? Like, you don't know if we're going to be rescued. You're promised a rescue. We're promised to be taken care of. We're promised that God is working in the world to rescue the world and to rescue us. And it says we wait for it with patience, but we can't see it. And that's where the Spirit comes in. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. A weakness to do what? It's a weakness to wait. So here we are in this powerless moment, and God comes straight through and he says, I know, and I'm here to help. I'm here to give you the strength to wait patiently for the promise, the promise that a rescue is on its way, a promise that God is working in the world to redeem us and to rescue us. And I think that's a powerful truth, that if that was real, then, then could we lean into God and his spirit to say, God, you asked me to wait with hope and with patience. I am weak. I can't do that. So I need you to, to move in my direction. I need you to help me in my weakness. Um, let's go down to the next verse. I want to show you this next part. It just gets better. Verse 28. For we know that those who love God, all things work together for good. That's a wild phrase. Uh, all isn't some. All isn't a handful of things. All isn't just a few things that I like. All things work together for good. Now, if you thought about to the verse first we started about, it started with suffering. So the readers of this epistle 2,000 years ago heard this in this context. You're suffering right now. You're suffering right now. The world's suffering. You're suffering personally. But you need to have hope that God's got a rescue. I know you feel weak about that, but I'm going to help you with your weakness. And by the way, everything that's happening right now will work together for good. How in the heck do we believe that? I mean, is this some kind of like, uh, you know, easy peasy, something we tell five-year-olds, you know, maybe they fell on their face and we're like, well, it's all going to work together for you. 
You know what I mean? Is this a, is this a, a nursery school rhyme? Like a fairy tale thought? Or is God's word actually saying something that we should believe? That all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his, what? His purpose. That means nothing that's happening right now is an accident. For those he foreknew. That means he knew us before this all happened. He predestined, that means he decided to be what? To be conformed or changed to the image of his son. So here's the big idea. Everything that's happening right now will be for our good. Everything. And God knew it before it ever happened. God is not up there as if he's somehow out of control. He's not up there as if this is somehow some tornado he didn't know was going to happen and he didn't know what to do about it. He knew about it. He has a plan for it, and the plan for the people who put their trust in Jesus is to be changed to the image of his son. In other words, everything you and I are experiencing right now, God is using for the purpose to make you like Jesus, to change you and I to be like Jesus. So here's the next big question. Check out this next question. Can you think of a time when a painful situation deepened your relationship with Jesus? I'm sitting with some of my best friends here, and I know that they've suffered, and they've all gone through some suffering. And so maybe somebody would like to share. Maybe there's a time um, outside of this moment where something painful was in your life, and uh, it, it stunk. It sucked. And yet God used it very intentionally to deepen your relationship with Jesus. Anybody have an example of that? I know uh, just in my own personal life, there was a time that really addresses the first question about um, something that happened that I, when I felt powerless and my mom was diagnosed with cancer a few years ago and I felt powerless to control or do mm. anything about that. It was a very painful situation, but it, it really, getting that news, I felt completely helpless and the only thing I knew to do was to pray. Yeah, That's all I could do and mm-hmm. I was there was nothing else that was in my control to do. And so it, 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 it kind of drove me to my knees to pray about the situation and cry out to God. Mm. You know, part of that Romans verse talks about um, that the Spirit intercedes for us when we don't know how to pray with right. groanings that are too deep for words. Right. And that's, I, I kind of sensed that in that moment, just falling on my knees and praying and just saying, Lord, I don't know what to do. I don't even know what to pray. Yeah. But I think in that moment, it, he interceded on my behalf, yeah. and at the same time, he, the, the relationship between me and Christ mm. grew much, much more deep because I was forced through that suffering and that pain yeah. to draw closer to him. Yeah, that's so good. So good. Anybody else have a thought, maybe? Honestly, um, I can't think of a time when my relationship with Jesus was deepened apart from suffering, yeah. apart from pain. I'm not saying like he's never been in my life when everything's good, yeah. but it's through suffering and it's through those hard times that I've realized his depth mm. of his love. Um, Betsy Tinboon said um, at one point she was in a concentration camp, was headed to her death. Yeah. And um, she said, there's no pit so deep that the love, God's love isn't deeper still. Mm. I think it's in those pits that we get to see the depth of love. Yeah. It's hard to see otherwise. Yeah, that's really good. So, yeah, my whole life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All the hard things. That's it's hard to even imagine. Like sometimes it's like we just don't press into Jesus Unless sometimes these moments are there. It's like, God, why are you making me wait? Yeah. I mean, you know? to use the uh, analogy of working out, yeah. um, we don't gain muscle unless we break down that old yeah. muscle. And um, yeah, I think that's how God works in our life. Yeah, that's good. Anybody else before we move on? Um, just, um, just a little bit about what Anna was saying about um, yeah. not being able to experience that relationship. Yeah. As, aside from... Um, just trying situations. It reminds me of when Jesus was on the ship with his um, disciples, and he's asleep. Mm-hmm. He's comfortable. Um, the, some Bible translation says he had a pillow. 
Yeah. And he was asleep on this pillow. Yeah. And so when the storm started to rage, you know, his disciples went to him like, don't you care? You mm. know what's going on with us? And, you know, he looks at them and it's like, be of little faith. Yeah. You know? And so my thought is my challenge in this season, just before um, we um, things changed so rapidly. Yeah. Um, I was in a trying time where yeah. I just I felt like I couldn't measure up with the world's yeah. systems. Yeah. Yeah. Like talking about workplace standards. And right. So um, just always feeling you're just not meeting the standard. Mm. And so that was one of the scriptures that I read during that time. And the, the message was he's on the ship with us. Yeah. He's there with us. But that's a challenge. Yeah. To know daily that no matter what we're going through. Yeah. Believing. He's right here with you. Right. And though the storm is raging, yeah. like he's still right there believing that. And yeah. So. And that's so good. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I just, it seems like what this text is saying is that, um, that as we are in a moment and we're in a time, and, and this is not unique to us, that throughout history, people who follow Jesus have been like, God, what is going on? And it seems like the message that Jesus has for us is one, we are in a broken world. Like you're in a broken world. And there is suffering in a broken world, yet there's a rescue coming. It's a rescue you can't see. It's a rescue um, that you're gonna have to just trust is coming. So you have to wait. And yet it seems like in the waiting, he's changing us. That in the waiting, he's going, okay, you're weak, you're powerless. And I'm going to take this waiting moment, this waiting through things I don't understand. Why does he have to say all things work together for good? Because the people listening at the time, they know plague. Hey, the first century, they knew plague. They knew a lot of plague. Um, They knew suffering. And so for them to hear that and to hear that even in those moments of suffering and starvation, um, that God was still working in them to deepen their relationship with Jesus and to change their character. And uh, why are we any different? And, and you know, maybe, and I had this thought earlier is, you know, it could be that this is linking us up with more of a connection to the early Christians than maybe anything else I've experienced in my lifetime. I've always had everything I needed. And, and yet for maybe for the first time in my life, the uncertainty that, that we could literally be in a place where we may not get medical care, we may not have the things we need, links me up to the people of the faith in the first century who said, hey, like, I may not have enough food, and I may not make it till tomorrow, but I'm becoming more like Jesus. And I wonder if maybe that's one of the things that God's stirring in us in this time, that, that we would become more like Jesus in this moment of uncertainty. I want to, t- I want to show you what it says. Next. That's not all it says. This is like, listen, this is Fort Knox of God's truth. Uh, toward our situation. It's amazing. We want to go in there. We want to get the gold that God has put in his word uh, for us. Check this out in verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, why does it have to say that? Because it feels like everything is against us. It feels like the whole system is against us. And, And that's not even counting relationships. That's not even counting the things going on in our families. That's not even counting the workplace drama that we all have to deal with. We're just talking about the fact that there's a virus on the move and a broken world that's suffering. And he says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who can stand against us, against the purpose of God? And then look at what he says. And this is how we know the reality is true. He who did not spare his own son... Now, in other words, every resource God had, he gave us in his son. Everything God had at his disposal, he leveraged when he sent Jesus to planet earth. And he did not spare his own son, but he gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? God leveraged everything when he sent Jesus. Everything. And if he leveraged everything when he sent Jesus, then what will he not do to accomplish his purpose in our lives now? He's going to do everything he promised to do. And if he's for us, who can be against us? Which is an awesome reality. Like, how do we get our minds around that? Except it seems that Paul wants us to say, here's how you get your minds around it. 
you look at Jesus. You look at the cross. And when you see the cross, you see everything that God had at his disposal, leveraged in our direction, on our behalf, for our good. That's a wild thought. It's an amazing thing. So it takes us to like the next question. What's the ultimate proof that God is good to us and working on our behalf? And that's the slam dunk question. Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate proof that God is good and he's working on our behalf. And Jesus doesn't change. The cross isn't going anywhere. It happened 2,000 years ago. It's stamped in history. Whether you and I get sick, whether you and I see family members get sick, whether or not our job comes and goes, Jesus is stamped in history. God is good and God is working on our behalf. He just is. And what's cool about this passage is Paul's not done yet. Paul's not done yet to tell us what God says about this moment. So check out what he says next. Verse 33. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? That's a way of saying, who can come and challenge the people of God? Who can challenge the people of God? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died, and more than that, who was raised, and who's at the right hand of God, and who is indeed interceding for us. In other words, if anyone challenges us, if the system comes against us, it can't. If someone says, you're not good enough, if someone says, hey, you've sinned too far to be beyond God's love, what do we say to that? Well, Christ Jesus died. That's the shut up to every failure you've ever had in your life. That's the shut up to every mistake. That's the shut up to every bit of shame you and I carry. Any condemning accusation that would come at you and I, we're all gonna feel the weight of whether or not we made the right decisions. Did we go to the right place? Did we do the right thing? Did we take the right precautions? Did we treat people in the right way? Are we doing everything we're supposed to do? We're gonna wonder that all the time. And our own conscience will accuse us. But he says, but who is there to condemn? Jesus Christ died to take on the condemnation. And he's praying for us. He's fighting for us on our behalf. And check out what it says next. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? And if you're wondering if he's talking about a, just a person, or maybe he's talking about some bad mistake you made, check out how he fleshes it out. Can tribulation, that's trouble, or distress, anybody under any distress right now, or persecution, somebody coming after you, or food, you don't have enough food. There are people in our city who don't have enough food. Can that separate them from the love of Jesus? No, Jesus is not far away because we don't have enough food. Jesus is not far away if you don't have, don't have a roof over your head. Jesus is not far away wherever you find yourself. If you lose your job, Jesus is not far away. If you get the coronavirus, Jesus is not far away. So no persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. In other words, nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus. Let's see what it says next. Go to the next verse. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We overcome is what it's saying. Hey, sons and daughters of Jesus, we overcome. We overcome. We will not be stopped. He says, for I'm sure that neither death, in other words, you could die from the virus, nor life, nor angels, or rulers, or things present, nor things to come, nothing that's happened in the past, nothing that happens in the present, nothing that happens in the future, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's the big idea. We always win. We always win. The children of God, the people of God, always win. And we don't win through our own effort. In fact, that was what it said in the beginning. The Spirit helps us what? In our weakness. But we always win. We always win. 
Jesus always comes through. We always win. And whether we'll win whether we die. We'll win whether we live. We'll, we'll win whether things come and we lose our job. We'll win no matter what. We always win. The family of God, the people of God win because Jesus always wins. And that's where we stand. And that's the truth of God's word. And so the question is, can we come around that? Can the Spirit stir our heart with that kind of confidence in God? Because that's the kind of confidence we need. So I'm going to pray, um, and then Andrew's going to lead us uh, in one more song uh, here. God, we need this kind of confidence. You demonstrated your love for us through your Son. Your Son came to a broken world. He died a brutal death on a cross for the sin of the world and for my personal sin, for every broken, rebellious, deceitful thing I ever did. Jesus, you died on the cross for me. You made me a son. And in these moments of uncertainty, you speak and you say you're at work and you say you have a purpose, and you say we win. And we want to rest in that. We want to walk in that confidence. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, that's, uh, that's our service. And what we want to do uh, right now is um, there should be links right below this video on our Facebook page. And those links would take you into an online conversation with one of our small groups. Now, again, you don't have to be a part of any of our small groups. We would encourage you to jump in on one of those links and become part of the conversation. We're Listen, we're not just here to watch a video online. We are a family. And if you know anything about our mission, this is our mission. We're a beautifully diverse family family of broken people who gather around Jesus. That's what we're doing right now. We're gathering around Jesus. Now, it may not be that we're in person with you right now, but we are gathering around the name of Jesus. And then we scatter around the world, working to make disciples for the fame and the glory of Jesus. So right now, don't just turn off the video and go around your day. Would you jump in on one of those links, be a part of these conversations? Hey, listen, if there's something on your heart, there's a fear you're battling with, let us pray with you. Let's be a family together. The family of God wins because Jesus wins. And he is working right now to accomplish good in the world and in our lives. And so we're going to trust him. All right. Thank you very much.